Hello and welcome to the official podcast of Palate Exposure, featuring Ilona Thompson, a podcast for those seeking the ultimate in wine, food, and travel. Each week, she interviews winemakers, chefs, celebrities, and a variety of guests that shape the way we enjoy life. In this episode, Ilona sits down with Paul Michael of Peter Michael Winery, mm-hmm. um, who had been working before, I think, at Phelps here in, in, in mm-hmm. California, but not for very long. And uh, he joined us hardly speaking English. And uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, don't, yes, improve the wine, don't change the style, and learn English. <laughs> and, uh, but he, he's actually done a, done a you know, fan, really, we've, he's taken the whole portfolio to another, another level, in, in my opinion, um, making some of the most beautiful wines we've ever made. Well, and that's been well recognized um, by the, the critics um, mm-hmm. as well and uh, he's added so one of the early things he did was add O Parody to the portfolio as well oh, um, okay. so that so that was one of his first projects although I, actually I correct myself because he actually made the first Pinot Noirs from the Sonoma Coast so we planted in 06 and Nick joined us um, in early 06 that's when he joined us so yes so he has added uh, Huge, hugely to to the program of what we do, and uh, and that continues today too. No. Well, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I think we should try this uh, yes. Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, um, I was going so th- we have a glass of Après Midi 2014, um, which is a great vintage, and uh, this is actually um, growing in in the Le Pavo vineyard. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, in the various parts of the vineyard there. It is a uh, Sauvignon Blanc with a um, blend of s- a small amount of Semillon. Mm-hmm. And that will vary um, from vintage to vintage, anywhere between 5% and uh, I think t- up to 12%. Mm-hmm. Um, up to 14% recently, I think. 14%. 14% is the highest we've done. And so, yeah, we, we, we want to try and... It depends on, the, on each vintage as to how much that of Semillon it requires. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a Bordeaux-inspired... Uh, white wine, um, clearly. Uh, in, in the first few years, um, uh, the, the it was 100% Sauvignon Blanc, and it was when Luke joined us that, that he added the Semillon, and um, and it's called Apremidi, uh because it's a Sauvignon Blanc you can drink any time of the afternoon, from lunch onwards. It's a dangerous Sauvignon Blanc because I I have been not only myself enamored with it, but it's a reference point for a lot of people of California Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and again, in that spirit of, you're not about trendy, you're about being the trend. You're about really setting forth the philosophy that produces wines that are incredibly um, beautiful and elegant, but also so darn delicious that I have gone through a bottle of this while working. I probably should edit that out. Um, but it's that's how really compelling it is to my palate, um, and this is a 14, which is a huge treat. I don't get to taste library Sauvignon Blancs from your brand, so thank you for that. Just okay. Want to quick salute you <laughs> and you. Cheers. 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 Good health. Good health. Yeah. Absolutely. Good health. Wow! 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 Again, savory. That word minerally that we debated for a while. Mm-hmm. Really beautiful lemon blossom, a lot of really subtle citrus and floral components. Um, what I really love about this wine as well is the texture. Um, it has this really yep. silky mouthfeel. Yes. And the finish on all your wines. But, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, we talked about before the recording, is that sometimes it just doesn't get enough love it becomes a stepchild in people's minds because it's not as important as some of the red and other white varieties. But you've made a Sauvignon Blanc with so much personality and co- character. Oh, thank you. Um, so I, it was stories from the road, I think one of the regular stories we, from, from the road as such is uh, when this is poured, um, and this features in most wine dinners, uh, uh, it, it, people, their reaction is, uh, wow, this is, I, I, I thought I didn't like Sauvignon Blanc. Oh. But I'm but I'm loving this, and uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's got a sort of complexity and a, 
sort of gastronomic quality to it um, mm -hmm. that you expect from a Chardonnay. And mm -hmm. so you, you have Chardonnay drinkers coming and enjoying this. And uh, yeah, so. Now this is really um, my extreme pleasure to um, taste the library wine that is so young and fresh. Um, you know, again, I am continuously impressed with your commitment to integrity and quality across the portfolio. And now that I've learned that you make, I've always known it was extensive, but you said seven wines per release? Yeah. Um, so seven or eight, depending. Seven or eight. So yeah. that, that's, quite, that's quite a lot to manage, but they're all so incredibly different and have their own personality, their own storyline, mm. and very worth getting to know. We make 15 different wines, don't we? Yeah. Exactly. Total. Um, uh, yeah, so this is great. I think the important thing about this is it's growing. You know, you can make Sauvignon Blanc in many places, but um, this is growing in great terroir. Um, it's perhaps because we're Brits and we love our Sauvignon Blanc, and uh, you know, a good, good, uh, a good stable diet of Baronelle and La Doucette uh, is what I remember, <laughs> and uh, uh, which is Loire Valley, you know, yeah. uh, um, Sauvignon Blanc, but. Uh, I think we wanted a, a Sauvignon Blanc in our portfolio, and normally where this is planted, you would plant, um, for good economic reasons, uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon, yeah, and, uh, or Merlot, or Cabernet Franc, and, and uh, so but we put a, a few acres aside and, and make this, we make about 2,000 cases of this wine. That's still tiny. Uh, you mentioned you were in 15 countries, and that may be a better question for, y for you, Peter. Is 15 that wines. 15 wines, 15 and then wines. you have 15 different export markets that, you, that you work with. Um, <coughs> is there any markets that specifically have fans of a varietal, like some of them are more partial to calves, and some perhaps mm. gravitate more towards Chardonnay? Hmm. <laughs> I haven't noticed that. No, I've got to confess. It's, it's really yeah. quite balanced across the oh, board. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, we do have a couple of states that are inordinately fond of the Sauvignon Blanc, oh. actually. Hawaii and Massachusetts. That's quite a spread. <laughs> well, Hawaii, because, you know, it's Obvious basically reasons. summer there all right. the time. Yes, it goes the, really I, well I would have finished. guessed warmer states. Uh, and an enormous amount of... Uh, L'après-midi that goes to Massachusetts ends up on the island of Nantucket. Ah, now it's making a lot more sense. Right, exactly. And it goes really well with Nantucket-based scallops, I'll of tell you that course, personally. Of course, seafood, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and how's the Asian market? How's it different from so, others? Uh, well, uh, what, I, what I was going to say is that you, you just um, you, would, you would expect, uh, what, I, what I was going to say was, you find people know know us because of our Chardonnays, yeah. but often, like 50-50, you know, 50% of the time, people have no, come to me and say, oh, I, I'm looking forward to th this evening, uh, I know your reds, you know, I love Le Pavo, yeah. um, uh, but I'm looking forward to discovering your whites. That's really interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I've never had them. so. Um, it's 50-50. And, and, and so related to that, in Asia, you would expect with Asian food um, a, a, a preference for the whites. Of course, yeah. Um, but I, I, th I don't know that you know, that is the case, uh, really, uh, in, in Asia. I, I haven't really remarked upon that, I think. Well, well I think the collector community yeah. is inordinately focused on red wine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people that know our wine in Asia are very serious collectors. Yeah, of course. So yeah. those two things just seem to dovetail. Yeah. And you also support several charitable foundations, correct? So people might want to look that up if they're really curious about yeah, it. Yeah, right? we do. We do. We do. We um, so we have uh, the principal activity there is um, the, the Peter Michael Foundation. Of course. Uh, there's they, uh, there, and and in 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 Europe we have the Pelican Foundation as well, mm -hmm. which is we've been part of supporting. Um, but the Peter Michael Foundation is our own foundation, and and it it supports um, research into uh, the, the detection and treatment of um, prostate cancer, wow. and uh, and, and devastating. 
Well, well, that's right, and and really until quite recently been a, an underfunded, underrecognized um, cancer and cancer research requirement, and um, and so uh, we've been doing that for um, well a number of uh, twenty years probably in mm -hmm. total. Um, between our activities in the UK and the Peter Michael Foundation here, and um, and so, you know, we will classically, we w typically we will look for sort of the high risk, high reward opportunities uh, and um, research mm -hmm. projects out there, mm -hmm. um, which are not going to attract the big funding. Government funding, yeah, etc. Against the grain, so not the easy well, it's important. So that, that you know, th these research is uh, yeah. that's what they, they you need that gap, that funding gap to to substantiate uh, a a theory, and uh, and so we work with, um, for example, we work with the UC at San Francisco, mm -hmm. um, with uh, Dr. Larry Fong, uh, looking at immunology immunology treatments. And, and these these projects have, have are generating very good results, very encouraging results, and uh, and so it's it's rather than um, well, first of all, why prostate cancer? But prostate cancer is is, is as I said, it's un, it ha was under under recognised um, and underfunded, but it's also the advances you can make in prostate cancer. Such a complicated cancer, you. What you can learn there, you can then apply to other cancers uh, oh, as, as well, and so it's one of the more challenging parts of the body uh, for many, many reasons. Yeah. Well, again, um, if you guys didn't feel good about drinking wines already, if you didn't have enough reasons, there's one more, because you're doing a lot of good. Thank you, and, and we do we 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 do hold events. Uh, up here at the winery for that, and around the U.S. Uh, okay. So the Peter Michael Foundation has its separate website, and okay, separate uh, website. and and uh, that we do kind of foundation events, friends events, uh, sort of paired with Peter Michael wines. Um, and the biggest event is up here in in the summertime, generally. Okay. And, yeah. So go on the website, Peter Michael. It's Foundation. another way to come and visit us. Yes. And come and get to know us. That's Fantastic. for sure. Wow. Um, so what is um, the next wine that we're going to taste, and um, what is the story behind that one? So the next wine is Les Pavot. Um, Les Pavot means poppies, um, the Californian poppy, the orange poppy state flower. Yeah. Uh, it was growing here, it's and, on the label. Uh, and it's on the label. And to my point on that, you know, you can look across the room from a long way away, and you you spot that red poppy, um, or it's a gold poppy on the on the whites. Um, mm -hmm. You, you, and you, you're familiar with the brand, your instant recognition, that's, that was really important. It's an understated label, nice. very simple label um, in many ways uh, with, the, with the poppy. And that poppy, that's where it comes from. Uh, it's the Californian poppy yes. that grows up here in the springtime, makes the vineyards look beautiful. And, uh, and Le Pavo was, the, was that wine you know, that, that really that my father had in his mind at the beginning, a claret from California, mm -hmm. uh, which is Probably an oxymoron because it's California and you're not going to make a claret. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, you are going to make a uh, you can make a, an elegant um, again an elegant balanced classical um, Bordeaux blend, and that's what Le Pavo is. And so it's uh, it's it's roughly two thirds Cabernet Sauvignon, or r roughly 65 percent um, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and then. Uh, Cabernet Franc and a little bit of Merlot on a typical year, and we've added Petit Verdot quite a long time ago. We've had Petit Verdot in this blend for many, many years. Um, so it's a classical, it's a classical blend. Um, yeah. Yeah. This wine definitely uh, is highly cerebral and at the same time hedonistic. That's mm -hmm. how it always landed on me in this particular vintage that's 2015 we're trying um, is no exception. It has remarkable stamina. Um, as I'm talking, I'm sort of subconsciously counting the seconds in my head of the finish because it's quite long. Um, but the wine, I know 2015 for most were, uh, was a rather short vintage, um, but rather concentrated one. Was that the case for you as well? Was, was the yield down in that? 
vintage? Uh, 15 was a relatively small vintage. Okay. <clears throat> um, if I'm recalling correctly, bloom and sap were a little bit problematic, so that mm -hmm. cut the crop size down to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the produced wines for a lot of folks that are um, very good at what they do and make great wines, it was the vintage that was definitely a standout came on the heel of 14. Um, that was also noted for quality, uh, but 15 was, um, I think, for many producers, very, very short crop, but um, very notable. And um, this wine definitely deserves its own separate conversation. I think it deserves its own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I have to have a conversation with it. <laughs> well, it's... Um it, it's uh, growing on the hillside here. Uh, the vineyard starts at about 800 feet and goes up to 1,200 feet. It's a 60-acre uh, site, and um, so it, it's. I guess it's probably that we make more of this wine than anything else. So, so we make about 3,000 cases of this wine. Which is still again tiny. Which is still tiny. Pointing it out. <laughs> yeah, it's still it's still because, small. It's all yeah. small production here, but but. Um, so we make about 3,000 cases. Okay. Uh, we make a, it actually has a second wine called Esprit de Pavot that also comes from the vineyard mm -hmm. as well, which is a more of a freestyle blend, different mm -hmm. expression from the, the same vineyard. And, and we'll make sort of 1,000 to 1,500 cases of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but this is, uh, you know, you are looking in, it's protected, it's protected by that ridge that we're all in, and there's another ridge at the side. Mm -hmm. um, so it's protected, it's warmer than the Chardonnay vineyards up above. Which are right next to here, but just high, higher. Um, and uh, you can look into Napa Valley, the north end of Napa Valley, from this vineyard. And and yet we're we're here in with Sonoma. So this is a Sonoma Cabernet blend, um, and it's mountain it's mountain fruit. And so you've got some, you know, it, you've got some being mountain fruit. You've got some. A backbone of great acidity. You've got actually a minerality in there again. There's a different kind yeah. of minerality, but it's there. Uh, and you've got, um, you know, some blueberry signature and gorgeous fruit. A garrigue, you know, garrigue, uh, sort of herbal uh, notes in there as well. And those are the signatures of this wine year in year out. Yeah, the fruit is absolutely remarkable. And like you pointed out, the acidity, the framework. Um, it's so significant that. Um, again, to reiterate, it's an event, so you can plan your life around it. Well worth it. Um, I can't even imagine what it'd be like out of a large format down the road. Uh, good. <laughs> least, Very good. Um, uh, we've got a few of those sitting around. Those yes. of you that collect large formats, I know that every time I ask a question, there's a different tag that people take as far as the explanation as to why the wine sellers better. I'm not sure if you have a theory on that, but um, are you as far as why large formats seem to sell better than well, the regular formats? We'll go with what Nick Morley, our winemaker, says. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nick really relates it to the um, relationship between the oxygen so permeating the cork and the volume of wine yeah. in the bottle. Mm -hmm. That bigger formats basically are less exposed to oxidation because mm -hmm. there's just so much more volume in the bottle. Yeah, no, so that makes sense. That's probably the most common response and I'm glad that your winemaker <laughs> yeah. feels that way. And it's a huge incentive to purchase large formats. Um, it's certainly a great sharing opportunity and impressing people that, you know, hopefully you like, but even if you don't, mm. You're gonna make friends, um, I, and I think this wine benefits from a few from with a few a few years in the bottle for sure. Yes, as well. And the structure um, is, is remarkable, yeah. and there's there's this tension, the energy that mm -hmm. you can sense as you're tasting it. So there's almost this um, juxtaposition of really flush, big fruit that's voluminous without being weighty, yeah. and this energy and tension that's happening on your palate that I find quite remarkable. Well, good. Um, Thank you. I really hate to say goodbye to this wine. Trust me, it's not easy. I'm, I'm having separate anxiety already. Um, <laughs> but we have one more to taste. We do. Is, um, yeah, so we do. So um, you can come back to that. Good. In fact, what really, th th these two wines should be drunk 
together and compare because they are so the next one is O Parody and it's our Napa Oakville vineyard um, and so to be able to taste these two wines together you're tasting from the same stylistic approach mm -hmm. but two different regions of, of, of California and uh, you know albeit only what I don't know 30 miles away not not very far but um, probably less, less than that but uh, this is so o parody is the um, is the is the vineyard we purchased it was originally Choquet, the Choquet vineyard oh wow that's quite a famous site. So this this is exactly and um, we'd been looking for a while and and uh, so we were in the right place at the right time um, and so it bought its neighbor its neighbor's Dalla Valley mm -hmm. and it sits at a, a sort of 600 feet altitude overlooking uh, Napa Valley on the eastern side of Oakville mm -hmm. uh, it's got that famous red dirt um, that Oakville's known for and uh, you've got a you've got a it's, it's basically got a Napa cab here but it's a blend it's a uh, it's a 76 percent Cabernet Sauvignon and 24 percent Cabernet Franc and uh, reflecting the, the vines in that on that property and um, so yeah wow. enjoy thank you I mean 24 percent Cap Franc that's a pretty hefty dosage typically Cap Franc is smaller ratio to Cabernet Sauvignon and I mean what's typical um, it's just not as common for me to find a large component of Cap Franc and there's nothing like a good Cap Franc if it's good it's really good well Nick loves the Cabernet Franc that yeah. goes there um, he you know very much so and he calls this wine the Beethoven and he calls them Le Pave Mozart to kind of capture the different style. No, well, it's not a different style, but the different profile of what you, what you got in the glass there. Mm -hmm. um, so th it's definitely more masculine, yes. more meaty. Yes. Um, you know, you've got that fruit forward from forwardness from, that you expect from a Napa wine, from an mm -hmm. Oakville wine, uh, for sure. This will drink younger, uh, more easily. Um, mm -hmm. And a bit more of an herbal component, dry herb, mm -hmm. yep. um, which I really love. Indeed. Um, uh, tobacco. Yep. Um, for sure. And... Baking spice, maybe. Like yes. Spice. Yeah. Savory. Savory. Very much savory. Sure. Savory profile there. And, and uh, you know, th th this, again, this will... Nick says 20 to 30 years. This will uh, go. I uh, heartily agreed, not that you have the patience, or at least I don't, to wait that long. Um. So, <laughs> so we, um, we purchased the vineyard in 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought we were ready to go, and uh, so we thought we'd, our first vineyard would be 2010, um, but it wasn't. Uh, we were caught out. You have to pay your dues to a new site. Mm -hmm. So we were caught out there on our, and um, had, hadn't left enough cover, and there was a heat spike. Um, we hadn't got our irrigation, you know, properly sorted out there. So our first vintage was um, 2011, hmm. and uh, well, difficult, hmm? difficult vintage for many. It well, yes, made a beautiful wine from there. Uh, we had, in the meantime, removed uh, 10,000 tons of rock uh, to give the, give the vines better, better, you know, mm -hmm. areas area for root. Uh, for their roots and uh, for drainage, better drainage, um, and uh, improve the irrigation. Uh, we couldn't remove the rock, we had to crush it all on site. Um, and so uh, we have the most beautiful vineyard roads spread out throughout the vineyard there. Um, we then had that wine in the bottle for um, quite a while um, without a name because we got as I said, 15 wines. This is the 15th wine. And we, we the family name, they, they come up with a name. And uh, we welcome suggestions. But, you know, it's our prerogative. And, uh, but we couldn't agree on a name for this wine. And, um, you know, my father had ideas, and we had, had, had ideas. And, and it's got to be an original name. It's got to be a story behind it. It's got to be pronounceable um, yeah. in English. And uh, so, uh, anyway, we were we were every year we go up in the vineyards here in fact and uh, above above uh, above the vineyards there's a sort of hill on the top of the property here where we have our foundation events 
and we go up there on the uh, Perseid, which is the, the night of the 12th of August. Um, and 2 a.m., you get the shooting stars uh, peak. You know, the, the Perseid builds up over sort of over late July wow. and through early August, and and you can count one shooting star a minute at uh, 2 a.m. in the morning on the 12th, which we got this wrong before. It, uh, it is the night of the 11th, if you think about it. But um, so uh, uh, we go up there and we drink plenty of this wine, or these wines, I should say. Kids, kids have those things you like to call s'mores, <laughs> an American delicacy. And then, um, you know, you fall asleep and, uh, and, and you wake up after, you always do after a little bit too much good wine. And you wake up in the middle of the night and you can count these shooting stars and, and then slowly fall back to sleep. It's like counting sheep. Um, so we did that and um, when our youngest son was five, uh, he woke us up way too early in the morning and it was broad daylight, fog had come in and um, he was looking out across the fog, across the clouds, at little islands and he was floating on an island. And so he said, mum and dad wake up, we've woken up in heaven. And uh, which is just a lovely, little, lovely little moment, you know, and uh, mm. a lot of cooing and all that, as you as you do. Um, a few years go by, and we've got this wine in the bottle with no name, and the same event, you know, happens, and and Emily uh, wakes up and says, "Right, Paul, we've got a, we, we were there with some French friends, and uh, we said, Paul, we've just got to send a, a short list of names down to the winery. Uh, let's write the short list of French names mm -hmm. and." signed it off on her little iPhone, still in a sleeping bag. Um, Paul, Emily and the kids up in heaven. And then she asked her, how do you, uh, how do you say in heaven in French? And, um, and the answer to that, as our French friends confirmed, um, was, and I knew this too, it's au paradis. Wow. And we looked at each other and said, that is a great name for a bottle of wine. So that's where the au paradis name comes from. Um, oh, in paradise or in heaven. And, um, you know, as we were saying earlier, we love people to come here and, and uh, visit the property and vis visit this place, this little paradise that we have here. And uh, it is a, it's, it, it, never mind the wine, it's a beautiful property with the, wi with the mountain, mountain backdrop and the creek running all the way through it and uh, a lot of wildlife. It's uh, great, great to see, you know. We're going to go to see it. Wow. Well, you know, for folks that know you from the press accolades and you know all the love that you received over the years from official sources and the remarkable wines that you've crafted, I feel like you really lead with your heart first and foremost. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> passion and passion and heart. Absolutely, we we, no, we, we love this place, and uh, I think it's uh, my um, we love the people here. Uh, you know, it's a it's one big family here. Um, uh, we, there's 50 people working here every day, in one form or other, and uh, and we come come here and we always get a fantastic welcome. And my my father, it's his favourite place. I think he comes and relaxes here. Uh, sadly, my mother doesn't come here these days, but uh, she used to love it too. And um, uh, in as I say, I kind of. This has been part of my adult life throughout, and it's been part of my kids' life yeah. all through. And uh, we'll keep working on that 100 by 100 plan. It is so very special, you know. Um, wines are important, and the sentiment, and um, all the remarkable amount of work and intent and thought and expense that goes into it is important. But above all is really that human interaction. Um, I've believed for many years that wine mimics human experience and that's why there's such an intense emotional connection that people develop. And this is um, a showcase of that sentiment as we tasted through the wines and um, learned from your stories it became quite obvious that this is not just a long-term, a hundred-year plan, but that's something that you live out every day with everything that you do, and it permeates your every thought and every act. And that, to me, is the most precious and valuable thing of all. 
Um, and uh, an important part of terroir is the other people, it's man. That's right, human you terroir. Know, human terroir. Um, what is um, your vision for the future for Peter Michael? What does that look like? More of what you're doing or maybe some more plans? Yeah, well, we, 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 uh, I think really the vision for the future has been for the foreseeable future, because that's as far as we can see, right? Yeah. And uh, is um, keep keep it in, keep it in our family hands. Uh, yeah. um, you know, we're the guardians of what, what we're doing here and yeah. what's going on here. And then um, I think the f in the, f the foreseeable future has really been sealed with the fact that we've purchased this vineyard behind us, mm -hmm. up above us, yeah. and we're. we're we're budding over, and um, there's a, there's a it's a small expansion, but it's an important expansion, and uh, makes all the difference to 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 the availability of our wine. Do you have any thoughts? You've now observed the scene in Napa and conversely Sonoma, and probably other wine countries as well, but mostly since we're here in Napa. Um, what, in your view, has changed, or what? How have things evolved in Napa Valley? Do you have any? philosophical thoughts as to the larger community, wine community of Napa? Uh, gosh, that's a big question. I know, it's huge. Right? It? That's a huge question. Uh, and Napa and Sonoma you're talking about? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. like what's geographically yeah. relevant. Yeah. Um, press that's pause. Yep, no problem. Okay, so I, I think that you know, fir first, firstly, uh, I think this, the, the, the region's gone went through a trauma. Yes, uh, very much so. Uh, nearly two years ago, um, with the October fires, mm -hmm. and of course since then there've been further events you know, nearby as well. So yeah. um, I think that's uh, I, that, you know, this is a this is an idy idyllic paradise. Yeah. Um, uh, who uh, actually we could have introduced him. <laughs> oh, we can still do that. That's totally possible. Want to go and get him? Yeah. yeah. Okay, of course. He's kind of wandered in. Yeah, I know. That's mm. awesome. I love spontaneity. Yeah. You know, as you were talking about what a paradise Napa, what, Napa is, and. Um, Are you also, recording? Yeah. Okay, um, we're recording. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, so let me carry on. So, um, so I think this is a an idyllic paradise. People believe it, see it as an idyllic paradise, yeah. and it and it is. It's yeah. a, just the most beautiful, uh, unspoilt area, and uh, and I it, we've always described it as a kind of an o oasis. Even in California, I mean, California is a wonderful state, but uh, is, even yeah. within California, it's a, it's it's a, it's an oasis, and the the the, um, the, the fires that came through. Mm -hmm. um, uh, recently, kind of unsettled that and made everybody realize, gosh, you know, na the forces of nature can change everything overnight and have changed every a lot of people's, um, I guess, psychological makeup, yeah. makeup uh, living around here. And uh, and that all comes down to well, a, a support. Uh, yes. So, you know, we and, and, and many other wineries recognize the importance to support communities that have been um, affected by that. And Absolutely. continue to do that um, as well, and uh, and then we know what we'll get on to climate change uh, yeah. in a minute. But um, we have a we've just had a spontaneous new um, arrival. I'm very excited to interruption. interruption. Welcome, interruption. Hi, Harv. How are you? How are you? Good to see you, sir. <coughs> sir Harv Hi. is. Uh, Hi. Nice to meet very you. Very nice to meet you. I understand you've been here quite a while. I heard. Twenty years is that? Twenty-eight accurate? years, Sefiaro. Wow. So back memory. <laughs> 28 years, oh, 28 exactly. Years, yeah. start basically with uh, the family. Yes. Me, back in uh, uh, 91. Wow. And, also and then you, we were farming 60 acres? or uh, In that time, uh, yeah, 14 to 16 acres in uh, old uh, Cabernet Varietal. 40, did you say 14 to 16? Yes. That's it was that small, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's only uh, actually by the vineyard shaft right now in that yeah. section there, really flat. Uh, this half the uh, uh, 
bell coat uh, basically open the lawn there and uh, basically let bubble but uh, actual pines in the ground is only 16 acres yeah. yeah and now and now since then you planted Ah, now she's uh, with a new vineyard, uh, vineyard nine, probably now a hundred and fifty in the Knights Valley, two acres in no field, and two acres in uh, Sibiu and Pinot yeah. Noirs. I think it's really quite a serendipity. We're just talking about what a paradise Napa is, and you know, obviously the vineyards that we're talking about in Fort Worth, Sibiu. I mean, I again joke that God had a really good day when he made that particular piece of <laughs> land. Um, the stewardship piece of it, the fact that somebody has to be very cognizant and conversely very busy, it's a lot of hard work to actually That's manage it and preserve it. And here you are walking in, and it was like a sign. It's pretty, it's pretty you know, hard work, but at the same time, you know, it's, uh, you know, always saying many times is Paul here, but uh, working with the family and uh, definitely for it with Sir Peter and Michael, I mean, this it's very special. It's really special. This yeah, really motivate. That. You know, this yeah. uh, I always this came with uh, the conversations uh, when I'm talking with him to say, you know, I still remember when I give you a, a tour with uh, Mark Albert, Albert. You know, he say to us. Uh, the only thing I'm looking for is four thousand cases to I can drink with my family and friends, and I can, and if it is possible, to I can make a little bit of money. <laughs> 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 wow! And, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, I always remember him. You know, when I I'm be, you know, alone, and uh, I say, sir, uh, it's twenty-five thousand cases, and uh, it's not stopped yet. <laughs> but it's really nice. I mean, working with the family and uh, find those uh, special properties because this is what it is, you know. Uh, 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 nice Valley. I mean, Nice Valley, uh, you know, in the background to uh, Salina Mountain. I mean, you know, now how this looks, you know. First, uh, the Cabernet, then uh, after that, the Chardonnay. I mean, mm -hmm. and growing basically uh, three different varietals in the same property with, of course, these different elevations in uh, nice and uh, Chardonnay stuff, you know. Absolutely. No, the, there's so much variety, and I'm sure every day is a challenge. Every day is a challenge, uh, uh, yes. I mean, but, you know, there's always this welcome. But you I look happy, and I know how much you're valued. We've talked extensively about the people factor, the human terroir, people that make all of this possible. And I just want to thank you so much for your hard work. I've been the lucky recipient of tasting the delicious wines that were put together, originating from your hard work. Well, um, it's, it's Enjoyable. <laughs> with Thank you. Thanks, Half. Okay, yeah. Thanks. See you later. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I was getting on to climate change, and I'm yeah. not. A, I'm not a climatologist or um, an expert in any sense. But obviously, everybody's, especially this year, it seems, have become far, far more aware on a yeah. worldwide basis and um, and uh, accepting um, generally. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think that the the, the, those events of nearly two years ago mm -hmm. and last year um, are, you know, part of that. And um, but I, I think that the um, wine is is a very very visible wine making is a very visible uh, expression of climate change yes. and uh, mm -hmm. and how to react to it. And, and, and you know, wine is something that everybody, almost everybody in the world, comes into contact with. And and uh, and uh, if it cha if the character of, of wine changes that even that will make it very very visible and Absolutely. so the wine industry as a whole and Napa and Sonoma are part of that um, are, are and need to be uh, cognizant of that and it's, we're, we're a very visible part of that whole event yes. really. Um, well thank you very much uh, for your generous hospitality and certainly for being such a remarkable steward as a brand of the land 
that you treat with such care and thoughtfulness and of course for your philanthropy and for really being a beacon in many ways and a reference point for what good things, pleasurable things, intellectual things, stimulating and spiritual and inspiring things are all about. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again for tuning in to the official podcast of Palette Exposure featuring Elona Thompson. We'll see you again next week.